something like that, well, the end result was that I am experiencing myself not so much as a personality, but as a place where impulses happen. And I notice my impulses tend to sometimes seem to contradict each other, mm -hmm. um, such as uh, I feel a certain way about something, but I also feel a different way about that same thing. And I'm one, you know, in a way that is so recognizable, even though I'd never thought of it this way, quite this way before, it is so how I am. And in some ways, it's a little terrifying, and in some ways, it's like, yeah, so what else is new? I mean, what's the problem? I've always been this way. And it seems like something that I have thought shows there's something wrong with me. That, you know, if somebody says, what's your favorite color? You're supposed to have one. You're supposed to say green or, or blue. And, and, and I've always been like, it's green. But then the next person will ask me, it, it's brown. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's supposed to be a problem, that I'm supposed to be consistent. And I was seeing all this week that, well, but I'm not consistent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I keep thinking, well, but I'm, aren't I supposed to be? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, that seems like such a, a stupid question because, but well, whether I'm supposed to be or not, I'm, I'm not consistent. And I've been noticing that my lack of consistency, well, I've been thinking of that consistency equates to a personality and that I kind of don't have that. And I'm thinking, is this this Buddhist no-self thing? Uh, so I'm having a whole lot of thoughts about it. And mostly it feels like, oh, this is, this is good. This is fine. Mm -hmm. So that's what's been part of what's been going on. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's very good. That's, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, you know, I, I, I know it's the way people are. It's the way we are both that we we don't have that kind of consistency and yet we want everyone else to. You know, we want each other person to have a favorite color because it sort of simplifies them. Oh, you know, yeah. person A likes green and person B, their favorite color is, is brown. So this is all part of the whole process of uh, we create an idea in our mind of who person A is and who, who person B is. And, um, and of course that's also what we're doing for ourselves in our own mind is, yeah. uh, is, is we have a sense of being a self and so we feel like that self should have you know, a pretty clear-cut set of identifiable characteristics. Yeah. You know? And sometimes we, we, we push that and, and we find and then we, we really discover it's not true, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the personality, I mean, it, it, it's a construct, but it's more than just that it's a construct. It's a dynamic, constantly changing construct. Yeah. And uh, not just your favorite. Your favorite color is probably situational dependent, Mood dependent, you know, it depends on a variety of things. And, and, and if, you're, if you're talking about favorite color in terms of, you know, painting the outside of a house, it's probably a quite different thing than favorite color in terms of, you know, a, a, a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it uh, and and of course depends on the time of the year and uh, and all kinds of other things that that affect that. So. Yeah, the idea, the, the the notion that we would have that kind of consistency isn't isn't realistic. Our our the constituents of our personality are constantly shifting and changing due to all kinds of things, and so. So, in a sense, there is no personality. I mean, there's well, not the, a stuck there, thing as a person. Yeah, there, there's a a personality in the sense that that. Uh, there's, there's a collection of attributes that you have today and there is some degree of consistency of some, some of those attributes over the course of a few days or a few weeks or, or so forth. 
but whether it's longer or shorter, still every one of these is is a, it's a construct and it's a dynamically changing construct, and it's it's subject to being uh, radically altered at any moment by some new causal uh, uh, force that uh, that becomes a part of the equation. Good evening. So yeah, ex- exactly. You know the. The whole idea of, uh, of this is, you know, and that's what the, the uh, uh, no self or our anatta, an atman, the, the atman that's being uh, uh, denied is supposed to be something that's permanent, stable, self existent. And then the philosophers all get into that. Well, if something's self-existent, then this has to be true of it, and that has to be true of it. And it leads to a lot of logical absurdities, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, in, in in one way or another, philosophically, you conclude conclude that the idea of an atman, a permanent, abiding, unchanging self, is a, a nonsensical impossibility. But Far more useful and practical is realizing that, you know, as, as, as you are, that the, the personality construct that, that you are is, is the furthest thing from being permanent and, and unchanging. It's constantly changing. And as a matter of fact, that's wonderful because <laughs> that means that... <laughs> If the personal construct that uh, is in operation right now is not a very happy one, you could change that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's very good. You know, the, there's something else that I was experiencing pretty much concurrently, but sort of in a different realm, which is that um, uh, different phenomena, different stuff keeps coming in through the sense doors. That, and, and I apparently have this idea mm-hmm. that I'm supposed to be able to concentrate. And I can remember my mother saying things and teachers and so pay attention. Mm-hmm. And, and my sense, I always thought there was something wrong with me because I have always had great difficulty paying attention in the sense that they, mm-hmm. so that I, it's almost an addictive thing with me with certain experiences uh, like television. Yeah. where I don't allow myself to watch television anymore because it got almost addictive. Or mm-hmm. it may, I should probably say it was addictive because I so want to have my mind be steady. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that I've always felt like that, it's, that it bounced around so much. There's something wrong. Um, but I've been noticing a lot this week that my mind bounces around a tremendous amount. And that I'm quite uncomfortable with that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, while I can't see what's unpleasant about it, what comes up is unpleasantness. Like nothing seems inherently unpleasant about it, and yet it feels quite uncomfortable when I'm noticing it. Well, you know, continue, continue with the kind of investigation that. You, you have started here. Um, you're, you're looking at the personality as a construct, and uh, you need to understand the mind. You, you see, what was happening before is you were looking at the personality uh, that your view of it was was not correct and so uh, you look at it and you'd say it seems like there's something wrong with me right yeah. but there wasn't what was what was wrong was this uh, view of what a personality was supposed to be and the same thing is true uh, we, we're troubled by our minds and, and how they behave but the reason that we're troubled by them uh, is because we, we, we're not understanding them we're not seeing them for what they really are your mind is a collection of many different processes. 
thousands, I'm sure, at least, of different processes, sort of hierarchically arranged. And uh, one, one thing that you can distinguish about your mind is, is that it really consists of many separate minds. If you look at it functionally, there is sort of, a, a, you can divide your mind up in terms of, of the uh, sensory domains, the cognitive domains. There's six of those if we include the mind as a sense organ and thoughts and memories and emotions and so forth as a kind of sense object. Each, each mind associated with each one of those sensory domains functions autonomously of the others. It has its role to play, and they interact. So, uh, and, and I, I think a very good example of this is if you've ever been driving a car and you've either been thinking about something and very lost in thought, or else you're, you've got a passenger who you're having a very intense, engaging conversation with. If you reflect on what happens in that situation, uh, well, well, first of all, I'm, I'm talking about the kind of situation where <clears throat> you might have driven you know, a mile across the city and have absolutely no conscious awareness of it because you were total, so totally engaged mm-hmm. in something else. There is a part of your mind associated with vision that was constantly looking in the rear view mirror, the side view mirror, the cars either side, cars in front, judging the shifts in the traffic, seeing traffic lights go change one color to another, brake lights come on and off, turn signals. And in response to that mind, without any involvement of conscious awareness and no involvement of conscious intention, just following the well-developed programs that are established there, was uh, using greater or lesser pressure on the gas pedal, turning the steering wheel, using the brake. And, and it, there, there was no need for conscious awareness to be involved in that, or conscious intention. It was just all programs that you trained yourself. There was a time when you learned to drive, uh, and, and in the early period when you were driving a car, where you were very conscious of everything. And... Uh, and you had to be, otherwise it would have been disastrous. But now as a mature, experienced driver, you can have a conversation with somebody, drive all across town, stop and start at all the right times and, and, and avoid accidents and everything else, with no conscious awareness involved at all. Okay. In addition to that, every time you uh, increase or decrease your speed, or you turned a corner or anything like that, there was another area that the, the, your body sensations detected how rapidly you were accelerating or decelerating or turning and so forth, and adjusted the, the, the amount you were turning the steering wheel or the pressure on the brake or the gas or so forth to make it appropriate. So in, in essence, you see what I'm saying? We have three... We, we can identify in that situation in three separate minds. One is this thinking, talking mind that's hearing this conversation, hearing what, pastor, what your, your friend says, and thinking about your response and saying it and everything. A completely separate mind is looking through the windshield and in the mirrors and everything and producing appropriate reactions, responses. And yet a third mind is assisting that by judging whether you're... you're speeding up too fast or braking too fast or turning too sharply or so on and so forth. Well, this uh, the only reason that I took the time to explain this is your mind consists of all these different processes. Okay, One of the most complicated ones, we divide it up into six parts corresponding to each of the cognitive domains. I found that to be a very useful way to understand what's going on in this thing we called mind. But there's a seventh part, seventh part, which you could call the executive mind. And conscious awareness is associated with that executive mind. And conscious intention is associated with that executive mind. So what whenever something, you know, if you were doing this driving across and something unusual happened, 
a child ran out on the street or something, you would immediately become fully conscious of it, right? Mm -hmm. So it means that that visual mind that is doing everything automatically can immediately demand conscious awareness when it's needed. Or at any point, you could decide to pay attention to what you're doing for whatever reason. Usually because a thought arises, the thought comes up, you know, better pay attention to what I'm doing, and then for a little while you pay attention. But the function of that executive mind is whenever things happen that there aren't, you already don't have programs to deal with, then uh, you become consciously aware of these different factors and some kind of decision is made. But it's not like this executive mind has... All it has to go on is what these other mental processes deliver to it, you know, based on memory and judgment and past experience and things you've been told or heard or read or everything else like that. So that's where it makes its decision. Well, as you go through your day... Conscious awareness, this function of the uh, what I'm calling the executive mind, the, the decision-making mind, its job is to look after the, all those things that can't be taken care of automatically. Those things that are important, valuable, dangerous, whatever. Right? And... Uh, and, and so it's normal during the day for your attention to move all over the place. Sometimes your attention is, is on things you're seeing, and sometimes it's on things you're hearing, and sometimes it's on thoughts arising, sometimes it's on your emotional state, sometimes it's feelings in your body, pain here and there. It's sort of always looking around, checking to see if there's anything more important than whatever it's currently looking at that it should pay attention to that needs to be dealt with. And that's really important. You couldn't survive. You know, the idea of an absent-minded professor who burns the house down because he you know, leaves the tea kettle on and walks into the wall because he's not paying attention, you know. Uh, we can't afford to be absent-minded. So we have a mental process, a mental function that normally moves our attention around all over the place, checking to see, you know, whatever, if there's something else more important that should be attended to. And, and it will rest and stay on whatever is important. If you notice that there happens to be a saber-toothed tiger stalking you, you'll probably, you, the attention won't shift. It'll stay on the stalker for a while, right? <laughs> probably long enough to figure out an appropriate action. Um, things that are dangerous, things that are important, uh, for whatever reason, and there's a lot of different reasons that can be important, but of course, one great criteria for importance in the operation of our mind is avoiding pain and uh, experiencing pleasure. So, what happens? You turn on the television and you get transfixed by the television. You can't keep your eyes off the television. You watch the television show, right? You get caught up in it. Well, somehow or another, it's producing a certain sense of pleasure. Maybe it's triggering a lot of associations that if what you're seeing was actually happening to you, it would be important in needing attending to. So sure enough, that's where your attention stays. Your attention's caught by that. Not because there's anything wrong with you or, uh, you know, it's just that your, your mind's just behaving the way your mind's supposed to do and under other circumstances that would be serving a good purpose. But in case of television, it's just providing you a certain amount of uh, pleasure, satisfaction. It's triggering mechanisms that keep you engaged in a television show. Uh, we pay attention to those things that are likely to, that, that cause pleasure, satisfaction, or are likely to provide benefits for us. And we pay attention for longer periods of time to things that are potentially troublesome or dangerous, harmful, pain-producing, and so forth. When you sit down to meditate, your mind's going to do all the same thing. Okay, let's watch the sensations of breath. So, oh yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but now we've done that. Let's go check. It might be something else. Your mind naturally goes around. Well, you can change. You can train your mind not to do that. Within this context, you get up from meditating, and once again, your mind keeps checking around everything, so keeping track of what might need to be attended to. 
but you can train your mind so that every time you sit down, there's another mental process that you've cultivated which inhibits that mental process that normally drifts your attention all around. And that's what you're doing when you're sitting down to meditate. So we, we, all, we all start from the same place. And we have the same kinds of minds carrying out the same kinds of functions. And we have to, to make some profound alteration in the way your mind behaves. Um, it involves some retraining. What's well, that sort of executive mind that I was talking about? That's where all the training happens. All the automatic processes in my first example of driving a car were the result of learning to drive when you were fully consciously engaged with it. And as a matter of fact, everything that you do automatically has its roots in something that was originally done consciously and intentionally. So we can say, yeah, and that's why we can say, for example, if you manifest a personality tendency of becoming irritated and impatient, um, it has its roots in times when irritation and impatience as a possibility, sort of an in, something that's innately in us, arose in situations. And we actually made a decision to, uh, to indulge in that mental state, or it made us feel uh, stronger or better or whatever. So we condition ourselves to do that. And so then we are like that more and more often. To become a caring person uh, requires instances where you deliberately and consciously choose to be a caring person. And then you alter your mind so that you become a caring person. You become a meditator with good concentration, or you become a person who is uh, uh, a caring, compassionate person by consciously and deliberately conditioning your mind. And there's better ways to do it, better and more effective ways to do it, and there's less effective ways to do it. And talking about meditation, you sit down to practice and your mind does what it's supposed to do in that there is a mental process whose job is to shift the attention around to make sure there's not something more important you should be attending to do to. And after three or four breaths, when that's not interesting anymore, that mental process starts shifting the attention around. Now, if you feel if you feel angry and annoyed that this has happened, it's not going to help very much. Because this mechanism, you're you're not going to quench the activity of a mental process that you were born with that has allowed you to survive throughout all the days of your life, you know, by suppressing it in that way. Instead, what you do is you just keep bringing your attention back, bringing your attention back. And so what you're doing is retraining the mental process that has to do with with moving attention so that even though when it moves the attention around, it keeps bringing it back. So you, what you'll have then is the early meditator's experience of, of, of the mind you know, going here or there, but you, know, you keep bringing it back. But you try to use positive reinforcement of the new behavior rather than negative reinforcement of what's essentially a, a, a behavior that, that you can't and couldn't even if you wanted to uh, stop. The same thing with when, whenever your mind finds something that does seem important, stays on it long enough, you completely forget the meditation object. Right? And then, having forgotten it, when your mind gets tired of whatever that thing is, uh, by association, maybe that will trigger another thought and it'll go to that and another one. So you experience forgetting and mind wandering. Those processes, the, the mental processes that are causing that to occur, are, are really normal and healthy. All you want to do is to is to uh, cultivate new processes that bring about a different result. 
So when you become aware that your mind, that you've forgotten the meditation object and your mind is wandering, you want to reinforce positively that awareness. And if you positively reinforce that, then it will happen more often and more easily. <coughs> then likewise, you know, when you come and when you bring your attention back to the meditation object, every single time you bring your attention back to the meditation object, you're, you're training a mental process to perform a task in that in the context of the situation of meditation. And it will eventually, when, you know, you've repeated it enough times, it'll become completely automatic and you won't need any effort anymore. Same thing with that awareness that whenever the mind has moved away from the meditation object, that'll become automatic and instantaneous until you'll be aware, become aware of it even before the mind moves away. So anyway, the, to go back to the, the point of, uh, you know, most of you weren't even here when I started this discussion, but when you look at your mind, and you're baffled by its behavior and its seeming uncontrollability and its, its uh, uh, seemingly inner conflict. You know, I want to do this, but I don't want to do it at the same time, and you know, all these sorts of things. If you're looking at your mind as a single entity, it's not. It's many different processes, and and with a lot of processes serving different purposes, some of them are obviously going to end up working in opposition to each other. So a lot of meditation is just bringing your mind into a unified state where all these different processes are working along the, on the same agenda. The other thing is if you look at your mind as mine, then you're going to experience a lot of frustration because you don't have any control over your mind. As a matter of fact, the you that you would like to have control over your mind is an illusion. That doesn't even exist. There's these different parts of the mind. There is the, the conscious awareness, which more closely than anything else we tend to identify with as, as, as me, the I. And then there is conscious intention that arises out of that, what I refer to as the executive mind. That part of your mind that it just takes the information and opinions of the other parts of the mind and makes decisions about them and says, "Okay, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to do." And it's not like uh, e- even in that case, it's it's acting more like a, a it's its own kind of automatic process. You know, if the other parts of your mind give ninety votes for fried chicken and ten votes for fresh asparagus, you know, you'll order the fried chicken instead of the asparagus. You know, and then that's all. And, and you may think you've made a decision. You ever go in a restaurant? You look in the menu. And, oh, that sounds good. You know. Oh, but it's a lot of money. And, well, this I I could afford this more. It doesn't sound quite as good. So you've got all these different things. You've got one part of your mind. All it's concerned about is you know, how much are we going to pay? Another part of your mind say, oh, that sounds good. Oh, but I had that before and it didn't turn out that well. So maybe it won't be. And it's just all concerned with what it's going to taste like. And then some other part of your mind says, yeah, but this would be healthier and better for me. And depending on who you're in the restaurant with, you know, maybe, well, yeah, but, you know, what will they think of me if I order that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I mean, don't we all have those kinds of experiences? And we think we're making a decision. Well, really what's happening is it's like you've got this committee. Uh, you've got this board meeting and everybody's presenting their uh, opinion and in the end, what you end up, the decision you make, it d- depends on, it's, it's, it's not like there's a you that's making the decision, it's that there's a part of your mind that weighs and balances all these, these things and comes up with a net sum in the end, and that's what you're going to do, is what the net sum adds up to. Same thing with wholesome and unwholesome acts, you know? Um, <coughs> whether, you, whether you take something that is... Uh, not freely given or not, is the same thing. That decision is going to be a result of input of a lot of different parts of your mind that have been accumulated over a period of time. And it's the net effect of those that's going to determine your final decision, not some you that's either good or bad. There's a totality of who you have created yourself to be. And you're not going to be able to get around that. 
you know. What you can do, though, is in the rest of your life, expose yourself to positive and beneficial influences. Uh, be in the company of, of people who are of a virtuous and wholesome uh, nature. And boy, will that ever have a big effect when you find yourself in a, situ- a situation of making some kind of a, an ethical and moral decision. You will have loaded yourself up with a lot of really good positive influences and all of those voices will have a say in terms of the end result. But to try to control your mind in the moment, pretty pretty useless. All you do is, uh, is, is just create a, a frustration because it's not going to happen. And uh, your mind has many parts to it, all of them interacting. So. Good evening, everyone. So, I think it's time for us to begin our sit.